So I guess I'm the only thing standing between you and a party or an evening with your family. I'll try to make this as painless as possible then. I want to be really clear and set expectations about what this presentation is about. This presentation is about reading code. Did you see that slide this morning in the keynote that Chad mentioned reading code is important if you're passionate? I have found reading code to be invaluable, and I think one of the reasons I enjoy reading code so much is because that's really how I got into software. I was 12 years old, it was a snowy evening about 1982, and my parents showed up at the house with a Texas Instruments computer, TI-994A. Any TI fans? Yeah, we got at least a few. And I, I had not asked for a computer. I had no idea what a computer was. And of course, I plugged it in. I played games for a few weeks. But I quickly realized that they sold these magazines at the stores, per Texas Instruments magazines for the TI computer. And all these magazines would have source code in them that you could type in basic programs to create new games or create animations. And so I spent years of my youth just typing in programs for magazines and then debugging things when I didn't type it incorrectly. But I really learned how to program by reading source code out of magazines. So this presentation is really 60 some odd code snippets from the Roslyn source code base. And that, that's really all we're going to look at. There's one little demo that you might find practical. <laughs> but everything else is supposed to be you know, intellectually stimulating. right? This is the Roslyn source code base. And just in case you haven't heard of Roslyn, I'm not going to go into any technical details about Roslyn. I just want to tell you that this is the new C Sharp and VB compilers as a service. So instead of being the compiler being a black box like csc.exe, where you give it input files and it spits out an assembly and there's nothing in between, Roslyn has this nice, nice API where you can work with the parser and the lexer and the semantic analysis and the IL emission, all those little pieces are available through Roslyn. So when Roslyn was being created, one day Anders tweeted that, hey, we're opening this open sourcing this thing. We're putting it on CodePlex. It's now on GitHub, by the way. But this was a, a momentous occasion. When I saw that information, I immediately went out to CodePlex and downloaded all the source code because I still enjoy reading through source code. And this source, this was always the plan, by the way, there's a blog post out there from a PM on the team that said we had actually started discussions about open sourcing all this stuff back in 2009 with the original design documents for Roslyn. So it was always Microsoft's plan to put this thing out there. And now if you go to GitHub and you find the Roslyn source code, you'll see that they have pretty fully em embraced GitHub and open source. And they take issues on GitHub and they close issues and they respond to requests and feedback and silly things that people post about C sharp <laughs> on there. So github.com slash dot net slash Roslyn. If you pull down the source code, it's amazing. It, there's a Roslyn.sln file, solution file, that you can open up. And there's 130 projects inside. And there's over 3.5 million lines of code. There's probably more even now. That was back when I looked at it in June. And that's C sharp code and Visual Basic code. And one of the first things that struck me as I started going through files is I've been in enterprises where you have projects with over half a million lines of code and a million lines of code. And in all of those projects, you always find that dirty area, <laughs> something where someone has copy and pasted a lot of code or just code that people want to get rid of. The Roslyn source code, for the most part, is immaculate, which isn't that surprising. You know, there's a lot of sharp people at Microsoft working on the C sharp code base. And obviously, they're building the C sharp compiler, so they want to write good C sharp source code. And of course, they have all sort of automated tools like FXCOP and StyleCOP and things like that to make sure that someone does, doesn't go off the rails with strange formatting and so forth. So inside of that 3.5 million lines of code, which by the way, if you use one of these tools that will visualize a GitHub repository and show you check-ins over time, uh, it just bogs down the browser and explodes after about 30 seconds because there's <laughs> been so many commits in this repository. The first thing that jumped out at me from Roslyn as you start browsing through the source code is there are so many places insi inside of that source code where they are doing something because of performance. They're either doing a performance test or they're rearranging code so that it's more performant or they're calling out where hotspots are in the code so that if someone goes in later to change something, they're aware that this thing is being used quite frequently. And specifically, 
I started wondering what is the Roslyn source, what aspect of performance is Roslyn uh, concerned with? Is it using CPU? Is it memory allocations? Is it disk I.O.? Is it moving all your code to Azure because every Microsoft product wants to move your code to Azure? That's supposed to be funny. You can laugh if you want. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is it's memory allocations by far. By far, the number of comments about this is a performance tweak are related to we're trying to avoid allocating memory. We're trying to avoid allocating something on the heap. And if you think about it, that's a bit of a CPU optimization also because the, less, the fewer things that you allocate on the heap, the fewer things the garbage collector has to go through and clean up and find free space for and compact heaps and all that stuff. So most of the, the Roslyn source code is obsessed with trying to avoid allocating things that it doesn't have to allocate. And then if you dig through some of the documentation, not just for Roslyn, but also for uh, pieces of the .NET framework itself, you'll discover that they use this little tool called Perfview. Has anyone ever used Perfview? I have found this tool. I wish I had discovered it a long time ago because it's invaluable. Let me sit down for a second and show you about it. If you go to your favorite search engine and just search for Perfview Download. It'll take you to this download page at Microsoft. And when you click download, you will download a single zip file. And inside of that single zip file is a single executable, which is great because you can get Perfview, the executable, and just put it on a USB stick and carry it to a production server or something and run it. It doesn't have any dependencies. And I've run it now on a couple dozen production <laughs> servers over the summer. And it has always worked, except for one case where it was a Windows 2003 server. I don't know what they had done to it. But <laughs> what I wanted to use Perfview for was to find out what is happening on this machine to make things slow. Or sometimes I was trying to optimize code that we had written to try to speed it up and figure out what it's doing. And the great thing about Perfview compared to some other profilers is that, again, it's a single executable. You can stick it anywhere. It does a machine-wide collection, so you can look at everything running on the whole machine. It's aware of managed code so it can give you statistics about the garbage collector and the JIT compiler and CPU usage. And I'm just going to run it for a second and tell you that this is a tool written by developers for developers. Uh-oh. <laughs> yes. Now, maybe that's because I already had it running. So here we go. <laughs> This is Perfview, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that I want to collect some information across the machine. It's going to elevate because it is going to capture something from all the processes that are running here. It's using um, ETW, event tracing for Windows, so it's very lightweight and it can collect thousands of operations. And I do want to caution you, if you try to let it run for hours, it's going to generate massive files, so you don't want to do that. But right before I tell that to start, let me switch over to a command prompt, which is somewhere here. I'm going to tell it to start collecting information, and I'm going to run a little program called Crazy, which will spin in a loop for about five or six seconds and allocate some memory. And eventually, that will stop. And I'll come back to Perfview, and I will stop my collection. And now, hopefully in another window, it's gathering information, gathering information. And eventually, you can see the little status bar working down here. <coughs> eventually, it's going to open up a window where I can see everything that was running on the machine. and essentially how much CPU time it was taking, and then I can drill into things and look at some very specific information. It knows about how to look at stack traces and so forth. And that will happen any second now. <laughs> ah, ready. OK. So you can look at high-level things, like you know what was running on this machine, what type of machine it was. That's boring. Uh, CPU stacks. I can see here that most of my CPU time was spent on this crazy process that was running. So let me double click on that and drill into it. And again, it's not a fancy UI. It takes some getting used to. And you can read through the documentation and click on the question marks to figure more things out. But right here, what we see is a visu visualization, interesting visualization, of how much CPU time was being spent, let's say, in an individual function. So a s every uh, increment here represents some amount of time. And I honestly, I can't remember uh, if it's milliseconds or seconds. I think it depends on how long you ran this program. But this is essentially saying 60% of CPU, 60% of CPU, 60% of CPU, 70% of CPU. So it's just basically telling me that we spent a lot of time inside of 
datetime.getnow, because that's what my program does. It sits in a loop and keeps calling datetime.now to get the current time and waits for six seconds to elapse. And is this useful? Heck yes. Um, we actually had a, a heavily algorithmic process that was running this summer that would run for nine hours. It would pull patient data out of MongoDB and just run for nine hours. And we were trying to figure out, gee, it would be nice if we could get it in to run in four hours <laughs> overnight. And we launched Perfview and took a look at the output and realized that there were all these places in code that were doing object ID dot two string to compare two object IDs as string. And if you know anything about Mongo ID, uh, MongoDB, you would know that you don't have to convert an object ID to string to compare it. You just do the comparisons, because they can essentially be com compared as numbers. Uh, that was actually taking a signif significant am amount of time, and we when we ripped that out, we cut the execution time down to six hours. It was very easy. But per Perfview helped with that. Other things you can look at are GC heap allocations. So what was crazy doing on the heap? It was allocating a whole bunch of daylight time instances, in 32 arrays, uh, lists. Those were just random allocations that I had inside of the program. So useful tool. And you find out that people in the CLR team use this quite frequently to figure out problems, particularly related to garbage collection and how to speed it up. So that's the practical part of this presentation. Now we will start looking at code. <laughs> You'll notice a lot of classes in Roslyn related to pooling to prevent allocations. So if I need a string builder in this bit of code and I do some work and instead of just throwing that string builder away when I'm done with it, let's keep the string builder around so that the next piece of code that needs a string builder, because you, you it turns out you need to do a lot of string building when, you're, when you have a compiler, we'll just reuse that instance of string builder, builder. So there's some classes inside of the Roslyn code that you could pull out and you stand alone to pool objects. Specifically, here is a pooled string builder in the Roslyn source code. Boxing, of course, is that thing where you take a, a, a value type, a value that can live on the stack, but you have to uh, go through an interface or something to get it, so it needs to be boxed, and that means there's an allocation on the heap. Sometimes you can't avoid boxing, so there's a class in Roslyn called boxes, and hopefully that's visible to everyone in the back, yes? Can you see the code on the screen? At least a few people have nodded, that's good. And this is something that you'll see time and time again in Roslyn, and it's something that um, you can take to heart if you try to do performance optimizations. Sometimes you can't make everything run fast, but if you can just make the common things run fast, that can still speed up your program. And if you look inside of here, what you'll notice is that, okay, I want to box a byte, but what I might do is just check this common occurrence. Is the byte value zero? If so, I'm essentially going to return something that I've already boxed, a cached instance of a boxed byte zero, all bits off, and that can speed things up. So in the side of that class, box, a, there's a box true boolean and a box false boolean and, and a box for all of the, the bits off for the va various value types. Here's a small concurrent set of ints. <laughs> and again, this is one of those cases where we're going to optimize the common thing. It turned out when they did some runtime analysis that a lot of people were using a concurrent set of, concurrent set of t, where the t is an int, and that 75% of the time, these things only had four values inside of them. So why don't we special case that? <laughs> where if you have four or fewer values that you're going to store in this concurrent set, we'll just store them in private variables instead of creating a whole list with all the locks and everything that's involved. And if you add a fifth thing to this, it will simply instantiate another version of this class and set up basically a linked list. So you could theoretically store 120,000 items in these small concurrent set of ints but that's not really what you, what, well, what you want to do. Yeah, you can see 89% of the time there were four or fewer elements. So they just optimized for that case to make things run faster. A small dictionary. What's useful about this one is it has basically the same interface as dictionary of K and V that you would find in the regular .NET framework. But if you have a trivi trivial number of elements, it's more than two times faster 
Around 120 elements, it performs the same as the built-in dictionary that we know and love. Oops. And of course, after that, it can slow down. A union collection. So here's the idea. Maybe you have a list of things and a list of things and a list of things, and now you have an algorithm that has to traverse all the lists. Instead of moving things around and copying references and creating one big list, just pass this union collection into the algorithm. And this union collection knows how to hand out enumerators that will go through all three lists, or ho however many lists you wanted to concat together, but without allocating new things. Empty collections, so again, specializing things. This is almost like the null object design pattern. So what happens if I need an empty enumerator? Well, there's already a, a static instance of it inside of my app domain, so we'll just hand that one out so we don't allocate a new one. Empty enumerator, empty enumerable. This is an example of a very hot code path. Because one of the things you have to realize with Roslyn is we're not just compiling source code. Roslyn is also the engine that is now running inside of Visual Studio. And every time you press a key, Roslyn's doing analysis of the source code in the editor so that it can paint uh, green squigglies and red squigglies and tell you what's wrong. So some things have to be very fast inside of Roslyn because we don't want to wait 500 milliseconds after a key press to get IntelliSense and things like that. So you can often see special cases where, where they will do um, crazy bit masks and crazy operations to try to make something as quick as possible. And the other thing you have to realize is they had benchmarks from the previous compiler, which was written in C++. So it's what they call their native compiler. And of course, that was very fast being written in C++. When they implemented Roslyn, it's almost all in C sharp code. And they went, wanted that to be as fast as the previous compiler, at least. So they had some hard numbers to meet. This is an example of avoiding convenience methods in the .NET framework. So the comment there says, yeah, we could have called streamreader.read to end, but that allocates a one kilobyte array plus a four kilobyte array plus a string builder. We can just do it quicker without calling that method by managing our own byte array. Split namespaces, avoid string.split because of the allocations. So they do their own split inside of there. Avoiding memory allocations, avoiding memory allocations, special casing things. This is one where you want to check if the namespace is too long. And one way to do that would be to concatenate a bunch of strings together and then getting a length. But of course, string concatenation re results in new strings that would then be garbage collected. So we're going to do it the hard way and avoid that. Here's one that you see quite often. So a lot of times, if we are writing some C-sharp code, we don't really pay attention to the placement of our yield operator. But it's very clear here that they want to finish working with node value and not have any code after this yield that still works with node value. Because when you have a yield statement in C-sharp, you probably know the C-sharp compiler behind the scenes has to generate essentially a state machine to, to represent this thing that's going to produce an enumerator. And if node value is used after the yield, it would have to include that node value field in a class that would represent that enumerable, that enumerator. And so if, we, we, if this would have been written as yield return node value and then stack.pushchildren stack node value, node value would have hung around as an extra piece on that object. So avoiding that. The document comment compiler. Instead of calling string.trim, we'll do it the hard way. <laughs> Again, avoiding, avoiding convenience methods sometimes to avoid an allocation. Get text. Here's another case of special casing things. So imagine you are asking the compiler, I'm going to get the text between position 1 and 10. OK, it'll go off and get that, get that text. Or I want to get the text between position 1 and 1. You know, maybe. That's just how some algorithm works inside of there. Well, if you do ask for something with a length of zero, we're just going to return string.empty. If you ask for a space, we're just going to return the string literal space instead of allocating things. If you ask for something with a length of two, and we've determined that the two characters you're looking at happen to be a carriage return and new line, <laughs> we'll special case that. 
And then there's another one here where we'll special case if you're asking for the text that is a, a slash slash or the start of a comment. Is this interesting at all? Okay. We'll continue then. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd run screaming out of the room. Contains tab. Someone determined that using string.index of was slower than just writing the for each loop and doing it the hard way. So obviously, that would have to be another really hot code path because you might gain you know, five nanoseconds there. But we'll do it the hard way if it means the editor performs better. And then, of course, not all of the optimizations in the, are in the Rosalind source code are for the runtime performance of Rosalind itself. Of course, you can also find all sorts of optimizations that the c -sharp compiler applies to your code when it's compiling it. So you can find things like the switch integral jump table emitter, <laughs> which will analyze your switch statements and determine if it would be better to set up a data structure so that it could use a binary search at runtime to figure out what to jump to. You can find that bit of code in there. And I'm not saying it's easy to read or get through, but there are a lot of comments that help in the Roslyn code base. What about interesting comments in the Roslyn code base? <laughs> you will find lots of times where they describe the behavior of the compiler and describe algorithms, and they will describe specific steps that they're going to take in the function that's coming up. So step one is we'll do this, and step two is we'll do that, and step three, we're gonna do that. This thing is basically, uh, the rewriters in the Rosalind code base are sort of optimizers in the sense that they lexically examine a uh, syntactically examine a piece of code and determine if something should be done, could be done to make it faster. And this is a little thing that looks at the using statement and sees if you have a value type that implements idisposable. And it tries to figure out if it can get to the dispose method without boxing your value type. Fascinating, I hear you say. Well, there's more. <laughs> lambda rewriters. So you want to know how the C-sharp compiler takes lambda expressions and rewrites them into something that ultimately ends up as Mizzle. This is one of those examples of, um, hey, here's the transformations we're doing. Here's the things we have to look at. It's all very well documented. I think it's a good example of using comments for good instead of evil, if you know what I mean. The language parser. So, so what I found uh, interesting about this bit of code, this, this falls under the, oh, I didn't think about that. Again, Rosalind, every time you press a key, Rosalind has to run some code and figure out uh, and tell Visual Studio where, where things are wrong, where things are right. So imagine you just have a programmer who I is crazy or has a cat that walks across their keyboard and they're just inputting garbage into the IDE. How do you... How do you in Rosalind, make sure that you don't get into some sort of infinite loop trying to analyze an infinite loop that someone has typed in, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and you'll see that they have to worry about cases like this, like, okay, this is, this is one where we think you have a bad await statement. And did you type in x or did you type in x and make a function call here, in, in which case it's not actually uh, variable declaration, those sort of things. All sorts of crazy conditions. Is there anything actually useful inside of here? Yes. <laughs> There's a path utilities class that contains a lot of useful things, like useful functions like is Unix-like platform, <laughs> and other things that are useful. File utilities. Here's a file utility that will prepare, delete, on closed stream for disposal, which calls into a Win32 API, and basically makes sure that when this File uh, opening the file stream is disposed, the file is actually removed from the disk and also prevents an antivirus, particular forefront something, <laughs> antivirus driver from scanning the file, which is interesting. Uh, so, useful. A concurrent, least recently used cache. If you ever want one of those, there's already one in the, the Roslyn Co's base. It's a cache with a fixed size. You put too many things in, it'll start evicting the least rec recently used <coughs> numbers. A concurrent set, what's uh, interesting about this one is there's already a concurrent set in the .NET framework, but this version of the concurrent set makes sure that you're using a concurrent set with a concurrency level of two, and that effectively controls how many fine-grained locks inside of the, the set are used. Uh, 
you can use as many as one per CPU, but this is always restricting it to two for some reason. <laughs> oh, if you're a Lisp fan, Lisp fan, any Lisp fans? Yeah, there's a cons list in the Roslyn source code for whatever reason. It's a Lisp-like immutable list. Uh, so here's an interesting one, one or many. Again, this goes, <laughs> it goes back to that situation where 80% of the time, this function returns one thing, and 20% of the time, it returns five things. Well, instead of always returning a list, let's return a one or many, because if I only return one thing, this data structure is optimized to store exactly one thing, and only if you have many things do we have to get an array involved. So one or many of t, like one or many of anything. String table was a class, actually, when I found it in the Roslyn source code, I puzzled over it a long time. Uh, I was trying to figure out what it did, but it's essentially this. When you call string, the only thing you can do to a string table, it only has one method, it's called add string. And essentially what happens is you walk up to the string table, you say add a string, like using system, I'll say add string. And the string table, when you invoke add string, it will return a string. The first time I go to the string table and say using system, it will return me a pointer to the string that I just gave it. But the second time I go to the string table and say add the string using system, the string table will say, oh, I already have using system cached away somewhere, so I'll return you a reference to that cache instance that I have. And that means this new using system can be garbage collected. And if we have 100 using systems throughout the source code files that we're compiling, maybe we only need one string to represent those 100 instances of using system, because strings are immutable. Don't have to worry about them changing. Interesting, I hear you say. Tell me more. Well. A weak list, so I want to be able to put things in a list but not have them prevented from being garbage collected. That's what the weak list can do. A tree dumper utility, which actually I would have found useful, you can pull this one out and it can take a data structure and dump out an ASCII representation of a tree structure. That's quite useful. Are there interesting pieces of source code in here? Yes, here's the PE writer. So the reason I found this interesting is because of this comment. True if we should attempt to generate a deterministic output. No timestamps or random data. And it turns out I ran into this. Many years ago, I think it was 2010, I worked for, did some consulting work for a company that had to bundle up all their source code and their entire build process and submit it to a regulatory agency who would then build the code and put the binaries in a specific place where they had to execute and they would do multiple builds, and if the build didn't produce the exact same set of bits every time, they wouldn't use it. Well, the C-sharp compiler and all this machinery, what it used to do when it generates an assembly, it would put timestamps in the assembly, so you know, we compile five seconds later, we get a slightly different assembly. There's also this thing it had called an MVID, which is a module ID, essentially a GUID, so a random number that would get stuck in the assembly, and it was really difficult Essentially, their build process, what they had to do was modify their build process to go through assemblies and rip that stuff out and replace it with just static data. <laughs> now, there's an option when you generate a PE file to make it deterministic so there's no timestamps or random data inside of there. Here's a class called no location. It's a class that represents no location at all. <laughs> I was particularly interested in how the c -sharp compiler transforms link comprehension queries, you know, the ones where you say uh, from foo in bar, select bar, and those sorts of things. You can find all of that code inside of a binder query.cs file, and you will see lots of comments inside of there where they'll say, okay, this is the type of query that we're rearranging now and turning into real executable code, or turning into extension method calls, basically. Completion utilities. Please don't hard code this. We should get out of the user options. <laughs> so here's a question for you. How many, or what is the most number of generic type parameters you've ever put on a class? Has anyone written more than three generic type parameters? A couple, more than 10? No. 
Yeah, I mean, once you get past three, it starts to look a little hairy, right? Well, <laughs> in the Roslyn source code, we have way more than five. There's a class out there, the Embedded Types Manager. Yeah, that is 21 generic type parameters. But here's the even better part. Notice this is an abstract base class. <laughs> so you know the deal. When you have an abstract base class, it has these generic type parameters, but it doesn't really need to enforce anything about them. When you create a concrete class that derives from this, chances are you'll need those generic types to implement some interface or you know, have some constraints on them. So when you look at the, one of the concrete classes derived from this, you have 21 generic type parameters and 21 sets of constraints, <laughs> which are listed here. <laughs> and it just, it's like a combinatorial explosion across the screen. I would like to think that a computer wrote that code and that a human didn't type it in, but I'm not sure. Are there interesting patterns? So I like visual patterns in source code. Yes, there is. How do you count the number of bits in an unsigned long? Like that. <laughs> I actually did some research on this one. If you go out and search on the internet for fastest way to count the number of bits, you'll find lots of research and PDF documents where people have done a PhD thesis on counting bits. <laughs> because back in the days when computers were expensive, if you could count bits just a little bit faster, you, you could save enough energy to power a, a small country. So people put a lot of time into efficiently counting bits. And you can actually find this algorithm in a PDF out there that says, yeah, if you do this right combination of bit masks, then you'll get the count of bits without actually counting bits the hard way. <laughs> we have conversion, easy out. This is a, a lookup table, basically, where, oh, I need to convert between a string and an object. What type of operation should I perform? That's what it's doing. So it has all, all the primitive types going across the top and across um, coming down. Sometimes you get the identity operation if you need to convert from a string to a string. Oh, there's some interesting source code in MS Build also. You would think <laughs> that this whole system is well designed and that if you're implementing some, something like MS Build, you probably have some deterministic interface or API to go out and grab errors that are produced from the compiler. No, it's actually regular expressions. <laughs> so regular expressions in there to parse output, compiler output. What about solution files? Surely. There's a solution file.cs file somewhere inside of Microsoft that would just provide the object model for solution files. No, we'll use regular expressions there too. <laughs> uh, here's a hash set that's in MS Build. And what's funny about this is the author basically says, this is the hash set from the core CLR. We just removed some things. So <laughs> you don't need to test it or code inspect it. but it's a copy of our hash set, ha hash set from the, the regular framework. A copy on read enumerable class, so this falls into the category of something useful. Maybe when you hand out an enumerable, you want to look at each object, an object that is going to be enumerated over and see if that object is clonable. And if so, what this class will do is clone that object. So you're giving a person the, a copy of all the objects that are in the enumerable. Look aside string interner is another one of those things that's trying to uh, intern strings. That is, take a string and intern it so it's in this, in this data structure in the common language runtime that manages, in addition to all the string literals, just, well, all the strings that have been interned. It's like a big cache. And the interesting thing about it is it's, it can cross application domains, app domains. If you have multiple app domains in the same process, they can all use the same string intern pool and this thing will put things into the pool, and an opportunistic string interner, and a reusable string builder, because MS Build also works with a lot of text, and a string builder cache, <laughs> lots and lots of things with strings. Is it easy to get the path to the .NET framework? Maybe not. <laughs> There's a whole class devoted to that, and it does a lot of performance optimizations. Air utilities. What they're trying to do here is special case a thing 
because quite often you write these utility methods that are just var arg methods, so they have a params at the end. And when you have a params, when you're using params, everything gets packaged into an object array. So if you're just trying to log something, but you have to pass in the number one to this u logging utility that takes a params ar array, that one gets boxed, and you have something on the heap. So again, trying to avoid boxing by special casing some things. And there's quite a few places in MS Build where they will lay down a, a .cs file in a project, and then they will share that file link to it across other projects, which is kind of interesting. And one of those files is internal error exception. And it's just, again, intellectually stimulating, if you will. <laughs> if you share this file into multiple assemblies, each project that builds that file is going to produce a different type because the type is a combination of the, the name and what assemblies it's assembly it's in. And you can get into trouble if you have a try statement and you call into some code that throws an, an internal error exception from one assembly, but you're catching the internal error exception that you've compiled into your assembly. It just won't work. So don't do that. Obviously, everyone will read that warning before they try that, right? <laughs> uh, escaping utilities. It is very important that the percent character is first. Just remember that when you modify this code, <laughs> when you submit the pull requests. Are there interesting tests? Heck yes, there is a ton of interesting tests in Roslyn. And there are thousands of unit tests. And when you look inside of the unit test, you realize that there, are, there can be hundreds of asserts inside of each unit test. They're just asserting little different combinations. So overall, I don't know how many, the exact number of you know, test tests are in there, but I would imagine it would easily be in a couple hundred thousand. And here are some of the examples. How do you test that the compiler is compiling code? I thought they would have had a fancy way to do this, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but you realize that over and over and over again, someone has just pasted in C-sharp code as a string literal, run it through the Rosalind compiler, and then sometimes execute it to verify the output, or sometimes uh, do some assertions against um, IL that might get emitted. We'll see an example of that. But I actually found this useful because Earlier this year, I had to write a code generator that consisted of some C-sharp code and some T4 files, and the T4 files would emit C-sharp code, and I wanted to have some unit tests to make sure that the emitted code would actually compile when it was put into a project. So I, could take some, I took some of the code from the Roslyn code base that will just take a string and compile it and tell you if there was any warnings or not when it got compiled. And it turned out to be really easy to write this unit test. All I had to do was take a whoops dependency on the Roslyn NuGet package to do that. So this is one of those examples where they're taking that code and executing it, and it should produce the result, one, two, three, when executed. <laughs> Emit test, how do, you, how, do you, how do you check that this class program static void main system.console.writeline produces the right IL? With string comparisons, of course. <laughs> How do you test that it produces the right PDB, PDB file? With string comparisons, of course. <coughs> they have lots of tests for breaking changes. Um, so things that used to work in the native compiler but aren't supposed to work, or things that didn't work in the native compiler that now do work in Roslyn, those are all breaking changes. So apparently, it used to work that you could have a pound define where you could specify the F in Unicode, I'm guessing. Some more breaking changes. Object A null equals null. Null coalescing operator null. <laughs> Again, I hope computers write that type of code, and it's not human beings. But you, based on Oliver Sturm's presentation this morning, maybe. <laughs> How do you test that the command line options are parsed correctly? Well, you have a bunch of tests that throw various command line options at the compiler, and you see what result it gives you. Did it tell you there was a warning? Did it tell you there was an error? And that's just another example of, hey, we have this hunk of code. We're going to compile it. We're going to verify that it produces the output minus 1 when it executes. And so, yeah, lots of little helpful, u uh, help, lots of useful helper methods inside of here, compile and verify. Ah, color color test. What the heck is a color color test? Well, 
Let's say you have a class called foo, and somewhere else you have a class called color, and now you want to declare a public property of type color called color with a getter and a setter. It turns out that this is actually has a lot of edge cases and difficult problems to solve. It's known as the color color problem. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. And so there's a whole bunch of unit tests to make sure that the Rosalind compiler behaves correctly there. And again, this is something I was interested in because it tests the hand handling of the color color problem. What the heck is the color color problem? If you do a search for it, you will find that Eric Lippert, of course, is the one person who has blogged about this to describe what the color color problem really is and what sort of uh, strange ed edge cases are involved. So. I'll let you do that reading as, as your evening exercise. Fuzz testing. So again, <laughs> if someone's cat walks across the keyboard, it shouldn't crash Roslyn. So there's a whole bunch of unit tests that just throw complete garbage at the compiler. <laughs> so make sure it doesn't explode or hang or fail. <laughs> Go to ascending abstract. Yes, apparently <laughs> there was a bug filed against the Rosalind compiler because it, in front of a, uh, many, well, not many, in front of a number of the unit tests in the Rosalind code base, there will be an attribute that describes what work item is associated with this code. So someone filed a bug against Rosalind that this type of code wasn't behaving correctly, and someone wrote a unit test to make sure that they had the fixes in, cha in, in place for Rosalind to behave correctly, so yes a switch on tests where one of the cases is crazy stuff. <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff. Here's an example of testing if the compiler can handle different conditions of if and else and ands and ors and so forth. So there's literally, literally just all these strings where there's little variations between the two. I'm actually trying to figure out what's different between these first two lines. Oh, because we have B equals C here, else D equals A. It'll just compile each of those and write asserts against every, every one of those. So like I say, there's hundreds of thousands of tests inside of here. Are there any to-dos in the Roslyn source code? There is, actually. So if you, if you want to contribute and submit a pull request, grep for the to-dos inside of there, and you'll, you'll find a few. And that, I think, brings me to my conclusion, which is that the Roslyn source code is interesting and, and you should check it out. Are there any questions? No. <laughs> Can we get out of here? Is that what you're asking? I don't believe so. <laughs> How? How do these optimizations improve the performance? I don't know the numbers. I've never seen any published numbers about how fast it is and how, mu how, like how many optimizations have saved what number of bytes. I haven't seen any of those numbers, but it's just my suspicion based on experience that it's not quite as fast as it used to be. <laughs> but it's pretty good for a, a big managed code base like that. Well, feel free to shoot me an email if you have a question or I'll hang out and take questions. Otherwise, enjoy the evening and the rest of the conference. Thank you for coming.